You're listening to Horizontal Power Hour, your source for anarchist thought, culture, and politics. I'm today's host, Kehaulani Kawanui. On our show, I'll be looking at queer sexuality and anarchism. I'll be sharing a recent interview I did with Terence Kisak about his book, Free Comrades, Anarchism and Homosexuality in the United States, 1895 to 1917. I will also be sharing my conversation with Jerry Marie Lee Gang, director of the Connecticut Trans Advocacy Coalition, who is also a member of Queers Without Borders. I'll tell you more momentarily, but first I want to note that Horizontal Power Hour is planned and produced by a collective called the Dream Committee. Members meet regularly to discuss and evaluate our process and ensure that all decisions we make are consented to by the entire group. Each episode is hosted and produced by self-selected members of the collective on a rotating basis. For more information, you can email us at horizontalpowerhour at wesufm.org. We air on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month at 4 p.m. and alternate our program with Indigenous Politics, which airs on the first, third, and fifth Tuesday of each month, also at 4 p.m. I'd like to remind listeners that the views expressed on this program are my own and in no way reflect the views and opinions of Wesleyan University or the WESU management. For that matter, what I present here doesn't even represent the Anarchist Radio Collective in its entirety. As mentioned at the start of the show, our interview segments today focus on the intersections between anarchism and queer activism. The first interview I want to play today is my conversation with Terence Kisak. He is an independent scholar living in Oakland, California. Kisak is co-chair of the board of directors of the San Francisco-based GLBT Historical Society and is the author of Free Comrades, Anarchism and Homosexuality in the United States, 1895-1917. to 1917. Greetings. Terrence Kisak, are you on the line? I am. Thank you for joining us on Horizontal Power Hour. It's great to have you on the show, and I'm really excited to talk to you about your book. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Great. Thank you for calling me. I'd like to start by asking how you came to write about anarchist sexual politics in the USA. Sure. Well, I've always been interested in the intersection of, broadly speaking, the politics of the left and sexual politics. And so um, when I was in school, because this is really uh, um, my dissertation that I've subsequently kind of adapted for a book, Mm -hmm. um, I first started doing work on the um, gay liberation, lesbian feminist uh, kind of moment in the late 60s, early 70s. And I wrote an article called Freaking Fag Revolutionaries. And it was really fun. And um, But then, of course, you know, uh, uh, historians are, are always want to do is, well, what about before? What about before? So mm-hmm. I started reading and poking around in original um, sources, and um, I came across the anarchists. And they clearly were um, dealing with these subjects at that intersection of, you know, kind of left liberationist politics and sexual politics. And mm-hmm. so it was a, just it was a natural uh, fit for my interests. So really an organic push back into the archives to look at what was there. Absolutely. Right on. I wanted to um, start with the title as well. If you could Mm -hmm. tell our listeners about the name Free Comrades and what it refers to specifically and how you're using it here. Sure. Well, um, Free Comrades was the title of a small journal that um, uh, some of the anarchists that I examined um, put out um, Mm -hmm. at the turn of the century. Well, actually in the early 20th century. But more than that, I think it speaks to the kind of essential um, spirit Mm -hmm. of anarchist sexual politics, which was comrades being equal people, um, each uh, person deciding for themselves what is right for their life, um, Mm -hmm. sharing it with another or others uh, for as uh, you know, uh, long or as short a duration as 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 as, as they see fit, and free, uh, just emphasizing that um, that notion of liberty. So uh, it also comrades, of course, has a deep resonance within the politics of of the left, and mm-hmm. uh, as well as amongst the anarchists. So it's kind of a and I should I should not fail to mention it also has resonance in terms of the work of um, uh, Walt Whitman and. Others who were um, readers of Walt Whitman, like mm-hmm. Edward Carpenter, who saw within his work kind of a, a liberatory um, queer politics, if I can use an anachronistic term. So, you know, tied into that phrase is just a lot of different meanings that I thought um, kind of captured uh, 
the spirit of, of, of the people who were doing this work at the turn of the century. And also for listeners who may not be familiar with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender politics and this concept of queer, mm-hmm. you've mentioned queer is an anachronistic term. Given the period that you're looking at from 1895 to 1917, could you speak a bit to terminology? Sure. Well, um, so there's a... a, a, a as different societies conceptualize um, sexual identity or sexual desire in different ways, and so, for example, um, uh, non-Western uh, societies don't necessarily have a social role of the homosexual or the gay man or the lesbian. Mm-hmm. They may organize their sexual relations and sexual desires in different ways. They have different words for them. They mean different things. And that's true not only cross-culturally, but across time as well. So at the turn of the century, though, there was clearly a kind of conception of a, let's say, a third gender or a a differently gendered person who desired members of their same sex, although you might say, well, are they really their same sex if they're a third gender person? Um, You do have a very different social understanding of what sexuality was and what identity was. And the anarchists at the time who were writing about same-sex desires we're trying not only to um, disentangle same-sex desire from negative ideas, uh, but also to kind of name it anew, and by naming it, give it a positive uh, uh, quality. So people have continually tried to do that, and so in more contemporary periods, let's say the last 15, 20 years, the notion of queer um, has kind of had a particular political resonance. It attempts to kind of break across barriers in terms of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, mm-hmm. and is more kind of a liberatory notion of sexual desire. That does or doesn't work for certain people. But when I said it's anachronistic, what I meant to say is that though you might say, well, there's a similar spirit, um, it really is a very different social and political context. And so when we look back, we have to try to understand, well, what were they talking about? And how did they understand themselves or understand others? And by they, in this case, I mean the anarchists. So when Emma Goldman, for example, read Walt Whitman and saw in it a depiction of same-sex desire, how did she understand that? What, what did she relate it to? Or... John William Lloyd, another anarchist who also read Walt Whitman, how did he understand it? How did he relate to it? So I guess terminology is important because it gives you a way into understanding how people are under um, conceptualizing themselves and conceptualizing desire and and, and how they construct politics around it. It's a very um, confusing and mushy uh, conversation, (laughs) but I think it's important to keep in mind that we just have to be really um, keyed into who we're talking about at what period in time and what are their influences. So, Well, I think you handle it really well in the book, and I think that it continues to be a contentious issue in general, just labels in general and categorization, sure. and people have contested ideas about that. I'll get to some of those key players like Goldman and Lloyd um, in a few minutes, but I want to ask if you could first tell our listeners more about the period your book examines, the late 19th and early, early 20th century, and how the United States and Europe compared with regard to activist articulations on the moral, social, and cultural meanings of same-sex love, and where anarchists fit into the picture around this sort of transatlantic debate, or how did how did the U.S. compare to Europe? Sure. So, uh, the late 19th century uh, and early 20th century, and that's the period that I cover for the most part in the book, both in the United States and in Europe, were periods in which there was large and very active uh, labor movements. There was um, large and active socialist party here in the United States, of course, as well as in Europe. And there was also a large and active anarchist movement. They were all um, at various kind of places on the map politically, trying to grapple with um, a rapidly industrializing society, urbanization, the kind of core problems of, of uh, 20th century modernity, if you will. At the same time, and um, not unrelated to that process, you have uh, a rapid development of visible sexual minorities, if you will, or sexual subcultures within urban landscapes in Europe and in America. And more so in Europe, you have the development of what we call sexology, which is the science of sexual difference, if you will. People trying to kind of write about these new, who are these new people who live in, in the city? Mm-hmm. And what they're basically talking about is, are um, uh, 
so for example, in New York, there was a, a gathering place called Parisis Hall that was in, in, in uh, uh, that had a a reputation of uh, of uh, um, sexual deviance, if you will. Um, people were trying to understand who are these people, where are they coming from, what does it mean that we live in a culture in which suddenly um, people are carving out a life that is markedly different than the one that you'd expect from, you know, marriage and three kids and et cetera, et cetera. So simultaneously, you have a lot of political upheaval, and you also have this intense fascination with the changes in sexual and gender norms. You have women who are no longer um, getting married but who are creating lives for themselves. You have uh, working class youth who are reshaping sexuality in radically new ways. And you have visibly queer people who are making a life in this world. It's a moment of great political and social and cultural ferment. Now, in your book, you argue that the politics of homosexuality outlined by the anarchists was unprecedented and unique in the United States, and that they were alone in successfully articulating a political critique of American social and legal rules when it came to regulating same-sex social relations. And yet you explain that... um, your book is not about gay anarchists. Mm -hmm. So given that few of these, you know, key figures seem to self-identify as same-sex lovers, Mm -hmm. how do you account for their willingness to take up this topic, and what interested them about it? I'll illustrate that or or explore that question by by looking at one uh, case in particular, and that's the Oscar Wilde trial of 1895. In 1895, Oscar Wilde is actually brought, there's actually a series of trials, and um, he's convicted of uh, gross indecency, um, uh, his sexual relations with with other uh, men, and he's sent to jail. Now, Wilde at this time is really a transatlantic, you know, he's a celebrity. Uh, he had toured America. He was well known in Europe. His plays were performed widely. His essays were were widely read. He was also a very polarizing figure, and he um, cultivated a kind of polarizing um, personality. Um, so he his his conviction was a real was was one of the first major sex scandals covered widely and discussed privately, um, and it was a clear example of the state punishing a man for pursuing his private desires. Mm -hmm. And the anarchists, um, really alone during this period, had a very clearly articulated critique of state power. Broadly speaking, not simply in the matters of private life, although they had that and others did not. So alone, or uniquely, I would say, they understood what it really, or they were able to kind of quickly understand what's at stake here when the state condemns wild to prison for his um, sexual desire. And they wrote about it in a political context. Others wrote about it, but they would write about it in kind of a moral or disapproving tone or, mm-hmm. or just as a kind of scandalous, uh, you know, titillating story. But the anarchists understood it as a political moment. And it's a really transformative moment for anarchist sexual politics because um, from 1895 on, they really kind of incorporated same-sex desire as one of the topics they would talk about when issues of sexuality would come up. That's what I mean. The anarchists were kind of uh, uniquely poised Mm -hmm. to understand sexuality as a political question. And so his case was a catalyst for anarchist sex radicals to raise these critical questions about the role of the state in restricting like, free expression of erotic desire. Absolutely. And you kind of have to, in the backstory to that really... um, is um, is an anarchist critique of marriage and an understanding of gender politics, really, because the key question around sexuality and autonomy in the late 19th century and well into the 20th, and one might say today, um, in very different ways, is the question of, of, of women's um, uh, sexual authority mm-hmm. um, and what power she would and could maintain in the institution of marriage, which, of course, was and still is... Um, a, a binding contract yes. um, uh, with you know imposed by the state as well as you know religious authority, so there was a broad kind of sexual politics which which was grounded in a feminist critique of state power mm-hmm. that enabled the, uh, them meaning the anarchists to 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 conceptualize wild's case as similar to or as related to 
So it's really kind of part of a larger anarchist sexual politics, and, and it's really important to kind of keep those two connected in your mind, you know, when you're thinking about these things. Right. And also that link, too, that I learned from your book is that this also uh, bridged discussions around sexual consent and also sex for pleasure and the rights to birth control. Sure. It's really about autonomy. And if, if you think about whose sexuality is uh, most the focus of control. Mm-hmm. Um, it was clearly women's sexuality and their reproductive freedom, and the anarchists were amongst the, the first and most vocal advocates of the right of women to control their own reproductive um, destiny, if you will, and also to recognize the fact that, hey, you know, women have sexual desires, um, just as men do, and mm-hmm. it's okay, and in fact, it's a good thing, and um, people should have the right to um, pursue those um, in these kind of, as long as it fits in the model of the free comrade, you know, and anyone can be a free comrade um, with another person as long as <laughs> they do it within the kind of um, uh, respectful boundaries uh, of, uh, of, um, of autonomy and right. individual rights. They're what you term politics of homosexuality linked to their overall political ideals and goals around freedom and freedom from state regulation. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Now, could you, you've mentioned Emma Goldman and, and John William Lloyd. Could you talk about the other radic- those two again and also the other radicals, maybe give a brief overview of who these key people were who threw themselves into this fractious debate about homosexuality? And also, I just want to remark for listeners on the cover of the book, there's a, um, a vertical rainbow flag or the paint, you know, the paint marks of the rainbow. And there are the five key figures, sort of a black and white uh, photos of each of them. Could you just give a touch on those five key figures? Sure. Uh, let me first mention the the, the, the cover, or the AK Press, which I which published the the book and I worked with, and they're an anarchist collective here, uh, as well as Edinburgh. Um, we kind of struggled with how do we represent this, you know, because uh, and so we came up with this uh, uh, this this notion of the figures with the little color splash on them. So mm-hmm. hopefully it works. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, Emma Gold- let me talk a little bit about some of the, the figures. Uh, there's a lot of secondary, if you will, um, folks in here. Um, the most important anarchist of the period was, was Emma Goldman, I- in terms of sexual politics, let me, let me say that. And not all anarchists were thrilled about Goldman's interest in sexual politics, and not all anarchists were necessarily um, advocates of uh, sexual uh, liberation. Mm-hmm. So that having been said, some of the most important and most well-known figures of the period, Emma Goldman being preeminent amongst them, were uh, advocates of uh, sexual liberation and uh, women's freedom. Um, And so Goldman in particular, for example, she uh, was well-known for for going on lecture tours, and she would lecture broadly about art, culture, labor, um, industry, the state, and she also spoke about um, what I... I use the term homosexuality, which I think for a lot of people sounds a little overly clinical and (laughs) analytic and almost off-putting. But at the Mm -hmm. time, it was a newly coined phrase, and that goes back to our whole discussion about language and representation and kind of attending to what people at the time thought about it. Well, Goldman was very interested in sexology. Sexology is this new science of sexual difference, and she read a lot, and she corresponded with uh, some of the leading European figures, Magnus Hirschfeld and others, and she was interested in this whole development of how do we understand this part of human nature. Mm-hmm. And so she saw this as a liberatory science, and I know that there's a whole, uh, a whole critique of sexology as kind of an uh, um, inherently oppressive, right. but I think what's interesting is that Goldman read it differently, mm-hmm. and she used it to different ends. And um, she was one of the great popularizers of these uh, ideas that the sexologists were developing, and she delivered them in the context of an explicitly sexual liberationist politics. Mm -hmm. So Goldman was well-known, infamous, if you will. Um, She was uh, often pilloried, but she could fill a hall Mm -hmm. and speak um, like no other anarchist of the period could. John William Lloyd is another anarchist, uh, a slightly, uh, not a slightly, a much less well-known figure, he wrote poetry. He was one of the editors of The Free Comrade. He was fascinated with Walt Whitman. Mm-hmm. Um, his is a very interesting and kind of complicated history. Uh, I'll, I'll leave, it to re- leave it to readers of the book. But, um, but there's all these different anarchists working 
on this question, and they approach it in different ways. Mm -hmm. And finally, one last person I'll mention is Alexander Berkman, who was, for a while, Goldman's lover, and for their entire life, they were collaborators in terms of their work. They both worked on the journal, the most important anarchist journal of this period, Mother Earth. Berkman served um, 14 to 15 years in prison for an attempt of uh, an assassination attempt on a on a, a leading industrialist of the period who um, who had brutally uh, suppressed a strike, and so he was viewed um, with some reason as 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 a as a uh, you know someone who's 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 who had contributed to the suffering mm -hmm. of thousands. That was frick. Now, yeah. yeah, frick. Um, whether or not you agree with assassination, that's a separate <laughs> question. <laughs> but. Um, Berkman went to prison. Mm -hmm. he, when he came out, he wrote uh, a memoir of his years in prison, Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. And in it, he discusses quite candidly and forthrightly the issue of same-sex desire, which has a place within prison cultures. But he viewed it through the lens of anarchist sexual politics, and so was able to disentangle the kind of more brutal side of rape and exploitation mm -hmm. from those relationships that he um, 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 was both experienced, although whether or not they were physically sexual is an open question, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that he was able to discuss with other prisoners, those kinds of same-sex relationships that really sustain people while they're in prison. Right. So... And Berkman's book was widely read. Um, so there's really a lot of ways. I guess what I'm trying to kind of, in, in this book, is capture all the different avenues that the anarchists took to discuss this question. And they did it in journals, and they did it in their published works, and they did it in lectures, and they drew on different sources to frame their discussion. Mm -hmm. So... Um, there are other figures as well, but um, I'll just leave those three are really mm -hmm. the most impressive, I think, and were the ones that I was most um, engaged by, right. Lloyd, Berkman, and Goldman. Excellent. I, I want to just say really clearly I really enjoyed this book. I learned an awful lot from it and think it's excellent and really important work. Um, we're running out of time, but I want to be sure to touch upon a, a few other things. Sure. Uh, your work documents how the way the left developed in the United States has much to do with why anarchism faded from collective memory in the early 20th century, mm -hmm. and note that much of this had to do with the impact of World War I. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in that for all kinds of reasons, but also linked to how you note that the contemporary LGBT movement in the U.S. is not a lineal descendant of this period of the anarchist movement. Mm -hmm. Could you say more about the impact of World War I and the development of the left, and also perhaps how the activism of the turn of the century anarchist sex radicals came to be buried as a political movement. Sure. So um, in, the, in the first part of the book, I describe what I think was really a really vibrant political movement that, that at its core um, had this question of, of, of sexual politics and an understanding of uh, same-sex desire. When the U.S. entered World War I, there was a, a kind of very rightward turn. I'm sure mm -hmm. we're all familiar with this <laughs> <laughs> from our own recent history, yes, unfortunately. And um, the state uh, took action against uh, uh, those that it saw as um, a threat to, uh, to, uh, to you know, people who were anti-war or who were seen as uh, dissidents. Many anarchists uh, were immigrants and they were deported, amongst them Goldman and Berkman. Mm -hmm. Journals were shut down. Uh, communication networks were uh, smashed, uh, some literally and also metaphorically. Uh, the movement took a tremendous hit. Simultaneously, you have the revolution in what, was then, what, what came to be the, the Soviet Union, uh, which presented a new model of the left, one which was very centralized, uh, Marxist-Leninist, um, political uh, model in which the state was quite central. And so, and, and they seemed to be successful in moving forward. In fact, they were successful in seizing uh, power within uh, Russia, overthrowing the Tsar, and mm -hmm. setting up this different um, alternative. So on the one hand, in the United States, the anarchists suffer devastating blows from the U.S. government. And on the other hand, People who are interested in the left, they are now looking to the Soviet Union and Marxist-Leninism and the Communist Party, which had a very different sexual politics. So uh, the anarchists were kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. 
This is not to say that they completely disappear, and I think you can see, um, you know, traces and, in fact, strong um, um, elements still at work. But there was a rupture. And so when you have a reemergence of sexual politics in a very different context, although still related to the left, Mm -hmm. in the 1950s and, and later in the 60s, there's not necessarily a natural dissent. People have to rediscover. Um, and there is a big interest, for example, in Emma Goldman. And there's a whole series of um, biographies that are written. And I would say in some way, um, my own book is part of that rediscovery because mm-hmm. it's an attempt to go back and say, hey, you know, this is not the first time that people have dealt with this issue. They did it in different ways in a different context. But what can we learn? What can we glean from their politics? Um, and also... I mean, isn't it a fascinating story? And shouldn't we really try to understand, um, you know, our own past? So it's not a direct history. It's it's one that takes, um, you know, all kinds of detours. But um, it's a fascinating uh, set of characters mm-hmm. and, and really interesting, interesting uh, perspective on American political and sexual culture. And and I also note, noticed that in the last part of your book, you document how anarchism enjoyed a revival in the U.S. and the rest of the Western world in the late 60s and early 70s. As we wrap up, I want to ask, how do things look to you now in relation to the resurgence of anarchism as well as contemporary sex radicals in the 21st century? Sure. I think it's very interesting because you, we have seen a real resurgence of anarchism, um, again, focused very much on kind of core social justice issues around um, economic uh, justice. So you mm-hmm. have, you know, uh, critiques of um, the, glo- the, the kind of globalization of, of, a, of a hyper-exploitive capitalism. Um, uh, anarchists are often the most visible kind of um, opponents of that, you know, at, in Seattle, etc. Um, but there's also a, a kind of resurgence of um, communication networks and people trying to um, use anarchist um, ideas to self-organize around more sustainable models of economic and social um, development. Simultaneously, um, you know, you kind of, we have this mainstreaming of, um, if you will, of gay and lesbian slash bisexual transgender politics. Um, You know, the big, what are the big issues that people are fighting for? It's, um, you know, well, the successful repeal recently of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which, I know, allows for military service for gays and lesbians. Um, And then, of course, gay marriage. Now, from the perspective of the anarchists, those are complicated goals. Um, (laughs) Or compromise. Yeah, I might say Mm -hmm. compromise goals. Um, You know, the first thing to say uh, is that I think that the anarchists would would certainly... Oh, I don't want to speak for others, but I will say that the principle of of equality and of equal treatment um, should be respected always and everywhere. And so that Mm -hmm. is kind of core. But having said that... Um, what you're fighting to get into, you need to examine what that is. Mm-hmm. And if, if the fight just becomes about getting in and not about what you're getting into, mm-hmm. i.e., um, great, we're, we can serve in the military. Well, well, maybe we should examine what the U.S. Um, foreign policy and military you know, kind of engagements are about right now. Is that what we really want to support? Mm-hmm. Um, or in marriage, um, you know, what, what is gained and what is lost when you fight for marriage to the exclusion of other kinds of relationships? Now, I don't want to, you know, I, I think there's more than one way to look at these questions, but mm-hmm. I think that anarchists um, and anarchist analysis still has a lot to, um, to offer to people who are trying to understand these, these kinds of questions. Um, and I, I think people are engaging them in that way. So, um, you know... It's a, it's a very interesting moment. I guess all moments are interesting in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, this is an interesting moment for me. Terence Kisak, author of Free Comrades, Anarchism and Homosexuality in the United States, 1895 to 1917. Thank you so much for being on Horizontal Power Hour. It's been a true pleasure to speak with you about your important work. Oh, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed myself. Please keep us posted on any new projects. We'd like to be in touch with you. Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Goodbye. Right, bye-bye. And again, that was Terence Kisak. The next interview segment I'd like to play on the show today is my conversation with Jerry Marie Lee's gang. She is a queer anarchist working in the greater Hartford area. She is a prolific writer who also produced the documentary on drag houses in Hartford titled While Paris Was Burning, Hartford Sizzled from 2004. She founded the Connecticut Trans Advocacy Coalition and serves as its executive director. She is active with Hartford's Workers' Solidarity Alliance, 
and is also a founding member of Queers Without Borders. Jerry Marie Liesgang, it's great to have you here in the studios of WESU and to be able to talk face-to-face about Queers Without Borders. Thank you very much for having me. I greatly appreciate being here. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here. Can you start by telling us what is Queers Without Borders, what is it, and when was it formed? Uh, that's a good question. It was actually, we formed it, an ad hoc group of uh, queers formed it maybe oh, 2004, mm-hmm. 2003, and we've always, this group of us who always work together, and we're sort of anarchist bent and are very much uh, active in our queer liberation, and also, importantly, with other issues. And we were at, uh, it was one of the times when they had Hartford uh, bring back the troops way mm-hmm. back when in Hartford. And they had a demonstration within the city of Hartford. We marched, you know, typical thing, marched through and stuff. But uh, basically when we were there, and we always bring the pride flag and we sort of try to give some visibility, though we don't look at queer as a pure LGBT issue. We could talk about that. But basically uh, people were saying to us, well, geez, we thought you guys only cared about marriage. Mm. And, we re- and, and one of the things we had, we had all been involved in organ- organizing. I created Connecticut Trans Advocacy Coalition. We had, uh, you know, other folks have been involved in organizing in Connecticut for quite a while. But one of the things we found that really did not exist was any really sort of queer liberation coming back, you know, uh, you know sort of to the akin of what was in the 60s, mm-hmm. and especially with the queer liberation front, not so much the uh, Gay Activist Alliance. Uh, or to, you know, but more to gay liberation front in its respect. But anyway, so what we felt is, you know, it is important to give visibility, and there's got to be a lot of other like-minded folks who really believe in these issues. And uh, so what we did is we created Queers Without Borders, and the the key concept of that is that we are here, there, and everywhere, and that's really sort of the premise of why we came with Queers Without Borders. Mm-hmm. But I know I had always been concerned about this issue because we put boundaries around everything, and being a transsexual person. I certainly, my life sort of is governed by these state, societal, mm-hmm. church boundaries that are put upon us. Mm-hmm. And so we felt very important that, you know, we are alliances. We do a lot of work with disability groups, differently abled. Uh, we've done demonstrations with ADAPT. We've worked heavily with the uh, immigration. We worked around when there were ice raids many, a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we really work within many different uh, coalition aspects. So the key thing is without borders is really sort of to get, you know, work within uh, coalition with many organizations. So without borders in all senses, including beyond sexuality or sexual orientation. Oh, most definitely. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Really, basically, you know, we look at queer as outside the bounds of normal society. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's, you know, it's sort of, and queer sort of got assimilated in, and, and really the, the queer liberation movement got very much assimilated into heteronormativity and mm-hmm. homonormativity. Mm-hmm. And we really were trying to sort of bring it back to its core roots. Right. I was talking to Terrence Kiesack on the prior oh. interview, and he talked about how the movement really did go for marriage primarily and also the don't ask, don't tell, you know, equality and inclusion rather than liberation. Well, well, that's the trouble. Is It's liberation, but liberation within the context of the state, the church, and society. And one thing I say as a trans people, and I do a lot of writing within that space, and I talk about tyranny of the state and trans liberation, is we cannot be truly liberated whilst the state, society, church puts boundaries around us, that they define legal, moral guidelines for us, Mm -hmm. and that really we have to sort of either diminish it or abolish those types of boundaries that exist within the society. Mm -hmm. Especially with the continued policing and regulations and also penality, the politics of punishment. Hate crimes is a good example where they talk about getting hate crimes legislation, and all it's doing is really just giving more money to the police. Mm. And and there are alternative ways to really deal with this and transformative justice approaches to really dealing with these issues. Mm -hmm. So along with that central uh, coalition work that Queers Without Borders does uh, in terms of broader social justice issues, what are the guiding principles? Uh, these, that's a good thing, uh, guiding principles. We, we sort of developed some a little bit more recently, but I think really our guiding principles were to be very much open. We did not define us, ourselves as purely an anarchist organization. We really sort of stayed away from li- uh, labels. But I would say our main bi- bi- uh, meaning binding principle was that we really fought the assimilist nature of the uh, queer movement, mm-hmm. as well as many other movements, even, you know, even, you know, di- uh, differing ability movements, a lot of them work within the system. And our guiding principle was that we really needed to give power to the people. And our demonstrations we did uh, sort of really sort of focused on that. Mm-hmm. But I, w- I would say, you know, bottom line is, is to really sort of fight against the assimilation and really wake people up. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
you have, let's just take within LGBT, focusing specifically on that, you have a lot of LGBT youth who come in and they believe marriage is the number one issue, that, uh, you know, don't ask, don't tell is important, uh, that, you know, and yet forget that these, we're just basically subscribing ourselves back to a system that by definition is oppressing us. Mm-hmm. And, all, and it's just like with me, with gender, I can move within a certain box, but if I move outside that box, the system clamps down on me immediately. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I would say that's sort of a key principle that we really worked with. Mm-hmm. So really to, to move, to try and struggle beyond, uh, to get out of the confines. It really is, an, and to get people to think about it. That's mm-hmm. the most important thing. Mm-hmm. We really aren't an org- you know, we're not a formal organization. We have, you know, formalized meetings. We really, our goal is to get people to think and to give the voices to the people, and that's where some of our actions really sort of uh, went to. Okay, great. When you also mentioned that, that the queer in Queers Without Borders actually even goes beyond LGBT, beyond lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, who constitutes the membership in terms of gender and sexual inclusivity as well as political orientation? Um, you said, you know, you move away from the political mm-hmm, labels. Mm-hmm. Is there sort of a, an explicit anarchist sentiment amongst some individuals that kind of gives it that bend? I, I would think, uh, yeah, I, I would think so. I think the key thing is probably, one is, I sort of come back a little bit. It's not like this really, you know, there's this core, we're sort of a pretty diffuse group of people and things like that. But if you take, and, and we've evolved over the years. People have come and gone and things like that, and we sort of evolved a little bit with a more recent group and probably took a little bit more of an anarchist bent uh, more recently. Mm-hmm. And I would say probably as of today, it does have a strong anarchist bent uh, with that. We have, you know, various people fall within different labels within the anarchist movement. But I think the anarchist lens is really sort of the the working towards sort of the abolishment of the state, mm-hmm. of the church. And that's really even that the church really even in the state go back to even our core days. As many people were we really felt that we were being oppressed within that. Within queer I mean, it's really people who practice different sexual practices. But, you know, it could be BDSM. Mm-hmm. It could be uh, that they, you know, they're just a girly boy. Mm-hmm. It's it's people who basically society says you're different. You're not the same because society continually tries since we're children and we grow up. Parents do this. Everyone does this. Says here's what you should behave like, be it through religion, be it through society, through behavior patterns, everything else. And people who say, I don't get that. People who revolt against that and say, you know something? I'm different. Mm-hmm. That really becomes where queer comes to because, mm-hmm. you know, a family unit, it's, it's across the board. So we, and, and, and so we began probably as an organization that was primarily people within the LGBT organization. But today we really have a broad spectrum of people, broad spe- spectrum of sexual practices, and really such a, a much more uh, broader sense of queer. Mm-hmm. And so flipping that t- legacy of stigmatization and pathology, mm-hmm. being pathologized. Yes, mm-hmm. yes exactly. Well, in terms of the loose network, it sounds like Queers Without Borders has that affinity group sort of sensibility. Mm-hmm. Could you speak to some of the activities that the group's engaged in with regard to events, direct actions? I know okay. you have a blog. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, we do have a blog. It's queerswithoutborders.com slash WPMU. And, uh, you know, or just do a search out there for Queers Without Borders and your trip on us and sort of the things we've written. We also have a Queer Voices. We do a newsletter uh, that basically is just really we reach out to people uh, to solicit articles on a broad range of queer topics. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, again, we probably do that every, you know, every couple of times a year or at least try to. Uh, With regards to actions, probably some of the earlier actions uh, are worth talking on. But if I looked at a high level, we... We've done, we've worked a lot with immigration, we've worked a lot with, uh, you know, fighting against the ICE raids, uh, fighting against the FBI oppression with the, uh, you know, with what's going on in uh, Michigan, if I recall correctly, Mm -hmm. and we're just sort of, you know, taking people who are generally activists and now calling them terrorists. Uh, Mm -hmm. We do uh, a lot of work within the anti-war movement, though it's sort of died at this moment in, in the state of Connecticut, but I personally uh, do a bit within that space. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I would say probably uh, two, a key one, one of the uh, early demonstrations that we did which really simple, uh, signified what Queers Without Borders is about is we actually did the Coalition for a Real Dialogue. And what generated that is one of, one of our members, uh, in a loose sense word members, uh, had seen that the uh, Bushnell was doing, they do speaker series. Mm-hmm. And they bring in these talking heads from outside, 
you know, from throughout wherever. And uh, they pay them a lot of money, and they, people pay a lot of money to come and talk. And this topic was about culture wars, and this was probably several years ago. And it was a very prominent topic at that time. And here we are sitting in Hartford talking, and we're having experts come in here, for, so-called experts, talking heads, coming in like Ralph Reed and others, to lecture Connecticut or lecture Hartford on the culture wars. And we said, this is ridiculous. And we actually tried to force the Bushnell mm -hmm. to then say, get rid of your talking heads and let's get some of the organizers within the north end, the south end, within the Hartford area that truly understand the culture wars. Mm -hmm. Not people who write for the New York Times or just, you know, are doing this because it's a way to get paid. Uh, but people who live and breathe this. And of course, there was a lot of pushback. They said they ignored us. Well, we ended up doing a great coalition with a lot of organizations, and we ended up uh, planning and then executing a demonstration directly outside of the Bushnell. So we took over the steps as the people were trying to come in for the talk, and we set up a speaker. We had a speak out. We put up a podium there. Uh, we had a megaphone, and we basically allowed anyone to come to speak and that they could come in the, in the community and talk about whatever issues were relevant to them. And it's funny because you had all these people dressed up really fancy coming in, and they're wondering, well, what's going on here? But it really was meant to make a message. And they actually, Bush now, because I was one of the key organizers within that, they actually were trying to get people I know to get me to cancel the event. Mm. I don't know why they were worried about us, but anyway, they really sort of fought to try to keep us from doing that. In fact, one of their people came out and spoke at it and trying to sort of uh, – pacify us by saying we understand what you're trying to do but they didn't i mean the bottom line is and it still happens in hartford we don't look at the people we don't look at the, the movement we, we get this thing of leaders mm -hmm. and i hate that word because the key is we are all leaders we are all can make a movement we can all affect change mm -hmm. yet we and again it comes to this whole thing of society boundaries society says well no you have to believe these experts so that was one thing we did we also did a political pride because pride has become a corporate pride mm -hmm. and that's you know really sort of and if you look at the origins of pride it has nothing to do with uh, what you see in a pride today it was a political pride they were really making political statements and for our listeners who aren't familiar with Pride, oh, you're talking you. about the, the Pride parades yes. that take yeah. place in Boston, yeah, New York City, exactly. and we have our own in Hartford. Yeah, we do have our own, and it has a long history of that. And the key thing is the Pride, pride uh, uh, celebrations came out of the Stonewall Rebellion mm -hmm. that in 1969, uh, and it wasn't middle-class white folks. It was queer, uh, trans youth, homeless people, uh, bull dykes who basically were tired of being harassed, beat up by the police. Mm -hmm. And they basically started a riot against the New York City Tactical Squad. And it was, you know, known well, worldwide. And it really sort of, and so that became a movement. And the Gay Liberation Front created several months after that. But that really became the movement for which really to say, let's align with the Young Lords, let's align with the Black Panthers, mm -hmm. that they really looked at a true revolutionary change that we could not affect change within the constructs of assimilation or the state. And really going back to Emma Goldman and the sex radicals, because that's really where a lot of that came from. And it sort of got lost after the sex radicals were sort of ostracized within the United States. Mm -hmm. And the gay and so the Gay Liberation Front was the next front. And anyway, long-winded thing. Well, and that gets back to that principle of self-determination, which I think is what bridges anarchist politics and queer politics. Yes, exactly. Very much so. And, and it is, because when we talk with anarchists, and, and, and Abby and Derek do a lot of within this too, is that uh, it really is sometimes anarchists have trouble wrapping their minds around this. And it's like, well, gay isn't part of this, or gay liberation, or queer liberation, and why are we talking about those issues? But it comes to workers' rights. It comes to the fundamental issues of anarchism. But, and that's one of the troubles I have with anarchism. Is like, people can come in very theoretically on the aspect, and that's always sort of a challenge with that. But to me, as a trans person, it has very practical implementation, implications. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask you about that as we're wrapping up. Given that you do this incredible work with the Connecticut Trans Advocacy Coalition and that you're also involved with the Worker Solidarity Alliance, could you just, in closing, tell us sort of what identifying as a queer anarchist means to you? I noticed that that's what you yeah. wrote in your bio. Yeah, I, I think probably the bottom line is that a liberation model I, I've done a lot of coalition work so let me back up a little bit I've done a bit of coalition work with other organizations and Connecticut Trans Advocacy does do some not, does do non-anarchist work because we have a lot of trans folks who are just surviving living in the streets and things and mm -hmm. changing the system 
and, and the constraints of the system is important, but also at the same time we need to recognize the needs for the people. But the key thing is that we, we need, so for me, it is really, I cannot be free. I cannot be liberated as who I am. And if you go in the clinical context, I'm a transsexual woman, non-operative. I cannot live free. I have all kinds of medical, legal restrictions. I have documentation issues, mm -hmm. which goes along with the illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants. And so for me, it is truly sort of saying I cannot be liberated unless I abolish the constraints of the state and the society around regulating my gender, regulating my sexual preferences, regulating my behavior, mm -hmm. and just how I am. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if that made sense. Oh, it does definitely make sense. Thank you. In closing, anything you want to leave us with? Uh, not a whole lot, but do check out Queers Without Borders. We, as I say, we definitely are always reaching out. And, and probably the important thing is to sit down, think. And, and i give you a good point. Anybody there who, okay, supports Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or is, is in the middle about, well, it's important for equality, fine. Take that. But one thing to remember is military recruiting. We had to work because it's a poverty draft. And so we worked mm -hmm. a lot, and a lot of activists worked to do military recruiting within high schools, where, especially within the urban centers, to really wake people up to, the, to what the lies that really can be said and the, and the misstatements that be said by recruiters. Well, this now applies to our queer youth. We need, as queer people, to begin to do an equivalent military recruiting to let them know and do specific outreach within the queer community. So, And, and this is where... You know, you really can start to twist the system and start to bring it back, you know, and start to really sort of create a movement that brings us back to our true liberation heritage. Jerry Marie Leesgang, thank you so much for joining us in the studios of WESU on Horizontal Power Hour. It's so great to see you in person and oh, to have this time here. with you. Mahalo. Thank you very much. You're listening to WESU Middletown 88.1, all the way to the left of your dial. This has been another episode of Horizontal Power Hour, your source for anarchist thought, culture, and politics.